Christopher Castellani is the author of three novels following an Italian-American family over several decades, A Kiss from Madalena, The Saint of Lost Things, and All This Talk of Love, a New York Times editor's choice. A collection of essays entitled The Art of Perspective is forthcoming from Grey Wolf Press. Christopher is the artistic director of Grub Street, one of the country's leading independent writing centers, and on the fiction faculty of the MFA program of Warren Wilson College and the Breadloaf Writers Conference. He also received a Guggenheim Fellowship for Fiction this year. His writing has been called clear-eyed and unsentimental, capturing the quiet yet absorbing texture of everyday life. Please join me in welcoming Christopher Castellani. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay in the back? Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, thank you to Matt for inviting me. Um, I'm very happy to be here uh, to be reading to you tonight. I know it's been a long day for many of you, so I'm really grateful for your attention to me. But if you don't want to give me attention, just save it all for Brock. Uh, that would be totally fine, because Brock is great, and I'm thrilled to be reading with him, our old friend. So very happy to be here. Um, so I'm going to read from All This Talk of Love, which is my most recent novel. Um, and. I have to do that annoying thing where I set it up a little bit ahead of time because I'm reading from the middle of the book. Um, so All This Talk of Love is about four characters in an Italian-American family in the mid-90s. And this reading's focus is on Frankie, uh, who's in his late 20s, and an ardent and somewhat pretentious but not terribly successful graduate student in an English lit program in Boston. He's living apart from his family for the first time in his life. Um, he's sleeping with his married professor and advisor, uh, Rhonda Birch, not only for fun and because he's enthralled by her, but because he thinks it will be an advantage for him in the job market. Um, and because we're on campus, I decided to read the sort of campusy part, one of the campusy parts of the book. So um, anyway, they meet in his apartment every Tuesday and Thursday afternoon. Um, to, you know, play. Um, she's, <laughs> she's on the committee for a big fellowship that's come up, um, and, but she has recently told him that she's not going to vote for him for this fellowship because she's afraid that people suspect their affair and this will give fuel to the fire. Uh, further context, uh, Frankie had a brother named Tony who committed suicide at 15 by jumping off the Delaware Memorial Bridge. Uh, two years before Frankie was born. And Frankie knows that his parents had him as a way of compensating for their loss because his now elderly mother has told him that that's why they had him. Um, and he's very close to this mother and calls her every night on the telephone like a good Italian son would do. Uh, so I'm gonna read just from the middle of this. It's about a 20 minute, 23 minute reading, so. <clears throat> An empty night, sorry, an empty train at night. <laughs> Let me start over. An empty train at night puts Frankie in the mind of Hitchcock, of Wharton, of James. He loves the grimy rumble over miles of desolation, the potential secret of the mustached conductor removing his gloves, the lonely tolling of the bells as they chug past abandoned stations. Frankie is his best self on an empty train. He can read undistracted, recollect his emotions in tranquility. Everywhere else, his dissertation shoots up around him, thick and noisy and unchartable as a rainforest. But on an empty train, he's a conquistador, out for blood and order. A rainforest seems downright pleasant compared to the Wednesday before Thanksgiving Amtrak Northeast Direct, and if the crowds and smells and constant shoving put him in the mind of anyone, it's no literary figure. Try Manson, or Wayne Gacy, or Mussolini. Mostly he feels as though he's being slowly lobotomized over the course of a wobbly seven hour trek from Boston to Wilmington. Around the time the train pulls away from New Haven, site of yet another famous university at which Frankie will never present a paper on modern psychology and post-colonialism, or whatever his dissertation is ultimately about, when a duffel bag falls from the overhead compartment and lands on his head. Oh no, that's mine, says a girl behind him. Jesus Christ, Frankie says, clutching his skull, 
He picks up the bag, which weighs about six tons, and hands it to her. Are you transporting gold bullion or something? I'm so sorry, she said. His first thought is that this girl looks like a Bryn Mawr tennis player. Silky brown hair and a ponytail, lots of makeup, white mohair sweater. A gold cross hangs from a chain over the fuzzy turtleneck. His second thought is that bullion is an extremely dorky word to utter in her presence. It's okay, he says, I'm still conscious. Inasmuch as any of us are conscious, she says, as she stuffs the bag back in the overhead. Excuse me? I noticed you were reading Being and Nothingness. Being and Nothingness, face down on Frankie's lap before the duffel bag bombing now glares up, up at him from the floor. The pages are dog-eared with yellow strips of paper sticking out from the sides. We just did that in philosophy, she says. I bet you actually understand it. And Frankie says, I wrote a paper once called, sorry, I wrote a paper once called For Itself, In Itself, By, my, by Myself. I got a C plus. <laughs> She's a senior at Boston College, she tells him, en route to her family's place outside Philly. In four years of college, she's never missed a holiday, birthday, baptism, confirmation, or wedding. The day she graduates, she's moving back to find a job as a middle school teacher. What a regrettable era of life, he says. Please tell me you're teaching kids to erase it from their minds. That's the thing, she says, her eyes suddenly silver dollar wide. It doesn't have to be so bad. They're doing amazing things with that age these days, especially in language arts. Have you read John Gogan or Atwell's In the Middle? He shakes his head. It's this new way of teaching where kids write letters to each other and keep journals and publish their stories, not just spit back spelling words. Kids don't even sit in rows anymore. How do they sit? In, in pods, she says. Pods? She laughs. Group learning and cooperation build self-esteem and make better citizens. Sister Carmelita used to throw chalk at my face when I got an answer wrong, Frankie says. I don't think self-esteem was her top priority. <laughs> and you're still a good citizen, she asks. You have me there, he says. They trade Catholic school stories for a while, him turned backward in his seat, his legs sticking out into the aisle, her leaning forward. Every time someone squeezes by, their knees touch. But she is five years his junior, not to mention a firm believer in the sanctity of the sacraments, and draws her knees back the moment the path clears. I need a girl like you, Frankie thinks, decent, salt of the earth, someone who cares about things like the self-esteem of sweaty, hormonal 11-year-olds. He's done with sex anyway. With Birch, he's had enough to sustain him through the long, fallow period sure to be necessary with a girl like this. Kellyanne MacDonald is her name. He's put in the mind of Irish fields, of green beer, of luck. What he doesn't need, a selfish careerist, a woman who betrayed, me, betrayed him just to preserve her already assured place in the polluted ecosystem of academia, a woman unwilling to take even the slightest risk if it meant a potential threat to her reputation as an even-handed scholar, a faithful wife, a willing slave to the whims of the body, a corrupter, but that's what he's got. The holiday week began well. He'd received a letter from the department chair pleased to inform him that the selection committee had chosen Francesco Grasso's application as one of three to move on to the final round. The letter didn't reveal the other two candidates, but he had no doubt Annalise Theroux, his theory had nemesis, was one of them. The third candidate was inconsequential. Birch had come through for him after all. In the, in the week since Frankie submitted his application, she promised him that if he had plenty of support and on the committee and her voice would not stand out as discordantly suspect, she'd join in that support. She also promised that if a vote came down to him and one other person, she would choose him. She arrived at his apartment as usual just after one o'clock. Frankie lay waiting for her on his futon, wearing nothing but the letter. I guess I squeaked through somehow, he said, taking the letter from its artful arrangement between his legs and waving it at her. How this happened, I wonder. Classy, she said. Come on, said Frankie, let me have my fun. We're celebrating. You did the right thing. She was still wearing a lot of clothes, though, which was rare for her. Frankie felt increasingly silly and confused as the seconds ticked by and she stood above him, hands on her hips, surveying, in her coat and scarf, 
his excitement over the committee's decision and their chance to christen him. Don't tell me you have buyer's remorse, he said, and covered himself with a pillow. No, no, she said, tossing the pillow aside. She looked from his crotch to his eyes, then back, then back again. And you just keep going, don't you? You don't give up. And I thought that's why you keep me around, he said. Plus, if I were going to give up, I'd have done it two months ago, or last year when you took a hatchet to my introduction. That was the Hindenburg of introductions, she said. She laughed, and Frankie laughed too, because she was right, and because it was during the protracted and contentious dis dissection of his introduction that they decided to walk down to Elm Street for a glass of wine. It was that glass of wine that led to her first trip to his bedroom. You've helped me every step of the way, he said, and he reached for her, but she remained stiff and unbearably clothed. I have to confess something, she said. It probably won't surprise you, but I won't feel right if I don't say it. I won't be able to enjoy this today if I don't. Well then, he said. He got up, pulled on a pair of sweats, and muted the Cure CD, Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me, he put in especially for this session. <laughs> I didn't vote for you, she said. I told you I would, even if the committee was deadlocked, but I didn't. In fact, there was a deadlock, and I argued for Mary Kessler. You made it to the final three without me. I'm in third place, he said. You had to debate between me and Mary Kessler. She crossed her arms and looked at him with some defiance. The uninformed, she said, are not permitted to be dismissive. Mary's doing some really ex excellent and difficult recovery work with Native American folk tales. You don't cast someone aside because she's had a few kids in between chapters. That's what got me riled up, actually. The way the men on the committee, Arbuckle in particular, your new champion, by the way, would react whenever her name came up, the sexism of that place. But it didn't rile you up that your advisee was floundering in fourth place. It worked out in the end, she said. I made my spirited defense of Mary. They chose you instead, and now we can just let it go. I wanted to tell you not to launch us into some debate over the absurd biases in the in English departments, but sorry, I wanted to tell you not to launch us into some debate over the absurd biases in English departments but because I don't like keeping secrets from you. That's the beauty of what we have here, right? The honesty of it, our flaws on display. He looked at her. She had a flat, wide nose and a jaw, almost manly in its severity, but the smoothest skin his lips had kissed, had ever kissed. There was a tiny hole in her right eyebrow where she sometimes wore a silver ring and the faintest shadow of downy hair on one side above her upper lip. She was beautiful in an unexpected way, like the angry little sister of the homecoming queen. And sometimes Frankie wondered if her rebelliousness was as put on as her jewelry. Keep going then, he said. Tell me honestly, do I really have a shot at this thing? She went quiet, bit that upper lip, released it, bit it again. You worked very hard, she said, with the tranquility of a guidance counselor. Harder than anyone, for sure. In that race, you've got Mary Kessler and that pretentious twerp, Annalise, beat by a landslide. But Frankie, and this is my fault, I take as much of the blame as you. What you've got so far of the diss, it's not, how do I say this, up there, you know? It's safe. My hunch says for this particular fellowship, the department wants to make a splash, bring an edgier voice to the fore, someone they can parade around MLA. Your stuff is solid, but it's in some ways old-fashioned. She clenched her fists. It's good, though, Frankie, really good, and solid and, and good, as I said. <laughs> I wouldn't be working with you if it weren't. You know my reputation. He stared at her, wanting to shut her up, but too stunned to figure out how. It was the first time she'd questioned the quality of his work. He was fully aware that he had a ways to go in terms of organi organization and focus, but his faith in the merit of the chapters had been like a jewel in his pocket. When he felt low, he'd taken out that jewel and admired it in the light, told himself, you may be lonely, Francesco Grasso. You may not know where you're headed. You may not understand the game, but at least you have this. At least this no one can take from you. Why not just kick me in the nuts, he finally said. I'm on your side, she said. I promise I'll be rooting for you in the final round. That's generous, Rhonda, really, he said. But because this was still a celebration, 
and a rare victory and the discovery of a new advocate in Professor Arbuckle. And because they now stood so close he could feel her sharp breaths on his neck, he willed himself not to blow her confession or her blind spot when it came to the defense of women or her cruel 13th fairy pronouncements on his work out of proportion. So he nodded, silently unwrapped her scarf, unzipped her jacket, grabbed her big, chunky belt, and pulled her to him. It was only after she'd gone, as, he'd lay, as he lay naked on his rough sheets, the late afternoon skies already darkening, that his fourth placeness settled on him. He did some further accounting. Fourth place in a third-rate department at a second-tier school. <laughs> Second place behind Birch's husband in her attentions, and second place behind Tony in his family's affections. In only one competition would Frankie Grosso be declared champion, the marathon of self-pity. And yet, he just kept going, didn't he? She admired him for that. He admired himself for that. Whatever design flaw had existed in his brother's brain did not exist in his. And now, there is Kellyanne McDonald his new friend on this wobbly trek down the eastern seaboard who has great respect for what she calls Frankie's, quote, interesting perspective on things, unquote. BC people look and talk the same, she says. No one disagrees or is disagreeable. The college is an orgy of politeness. She tr she's tried to branch out, to be you, to Harvard, but claims to have no talent for meeting left of center people and keeps settling for clones of herself and her current circle. Sometime around Trenton, she gives Frankie her phone number and campus address. So tomorrow, she'll be attending Thanksgiving Mass, and Frankie, a 12-year veteran of Catholic school, has to admit he didn't even know there was such a thing. <laughs> her hand is soft and creamy white. He holds it a moment too long as the train approaches 30th Street, and they say their goodbyes and we should get together. He enjoys his first sustained, sustained gaze at her ass as she drags the bag of gold bullion behind her. She looks back once before stepping off. He's glad Kellyanne McDonald is not around to see him take the ring out of his nose, replace his Holden Caulfield cap with a Timberland hat, drop his bracelets into the front compartment of his backpack, and put on a J. Crew sweater over his dead Kennedy's t-shirt. He now looks as agreeable and cooperative as a kid from BC. Though it's past midnight, the crowd on the train remains thick. Only a scant few of these people will disappear with Frankie into the vast metropolis of Wilmington, Delaware, or as his friends used to call it, the town fund for God. On the approach, the view from their smudged windows is the charming oil refineries of Marcus Hook, twinkling and pumping noxious clouds into the air, the stadium-sized lots jammed with cars, and the squat downtown office buildings, blank and empty as Sunday in Brasilia. A good place to raise your kids, they say, about this town. A short drive to Philly, New York, Atlantic City, Baltimore, D.C., but without as many problems, by which they mean crime, by which they mean blacks. Everything is post-colonial, even here. He is the first member of his generation of the extended family to live more than 30 miles from its aggressive mediocrity, to have the luxury of Boston culture at his fingertips, the lectures, the readings, the ghosts of Emerson and Thoreau, taking his hand as they cross the common in perfect exhilaration. If he's lucky, he can catch the train back a day early, ring up Kellyanne McDonald, and take her to the Battle of Algiers at the Brattle. But then, as he struggles to wrench his backpack from between two boxes of anvils in the overhead, he sees his mother and father standing on the platform. They are holding hands, searching every window for a glimpse of their son, relieved when they find him that Amtrak has delivered him safely home. Their faces say how grateful they are for this silly American holiday that reunites them, how they're planning every meal they'll eat this weekend, every visit to the old neighborhood. The moment he sees them, Frankie knows he will not catch the earlier train. He will stay with them until the last possible moment. His mother has had her hair frosted and her nails painted pumpkin orange. His father wears his leather jacket with the sheepskin collar. Frankie embraces him and rests his head for a moment on the fur. His father has grown shorter. The tremor in his arm, noticed in the summer but never discussed, is more pronounced. They bicker over where they parked, which neither remembers, and how long it's been since they've seen Frankie. His mother smells of Nina Ricci and baby powder. 
She felt tired for no reason all day, she says, her mind foggy. But now that Frankie's here, the fog goes away. All his life, Frankie has kept his mother from the fog. She rarely mentions Tony by name, and sometimes Frankie feels her trying too hard to remind him that he may not have been the first son born in the new country, but he inherited the promise of a great future for the Grassos. The best idea they ever had, his mother likes to say, was to bring Francesco Grasso into the world. Frankie has seen a hundred pictures of Tony, heard his voice on the one audio tape that survived, been reminded many times by his father and Prima of the little boy's energy and piano playing and pride in the family restaurant, but he can't summon much love for his brother beyond the theoretical. Without him, I would not exist, is the most he can do. But what about guilt? Birch likes to ask, and yet that too is theoretical. Once in response to her, he quoted Emerson, in the death of my son, I seem to have lost a beautiful estate no more. I cannot get it nearer to me. It leaves no scar. Birch had looked at him, puzzled. There's no colder passage in all of American literature, she said. And you've never known me to be cold, he said. My point exactly. It's so unlike you and such opposition to the Frankie I've come to know that I have to think it's some sort of block. I suggest psychoanalysis. I suggest you pretend you didn't suggest that, he said. <laughs> If anything, Frankie strives to be colder, to keep his distances. He's already deep in emotion. The last thing he wants is to go down the rabbit hole of Freudian exploration. Birch has claimed to admire his passion, but he knows that, in the Academy at least, passion and sentimentality and emotion are kissing cousins, and none is welcome at the party. It was to avoid emotion that he chose to live apart from his mother and father in the first place. If he'd stayed, he'd have gladly leapt into their mouths, and they'd have swallowed him whole. Frankie's problem is that already, in the first minutes of a five-day visit, in his parents' company, he misses them. They wander through the parking lot, his mother's arm around his waist, his father's unsteady hand on his shoulder. As he can't help doing upon homecoming, as Frankie does too often lying in bed 385 miles away, he adds up the years he's been given with his parents, and compares them to those he'll spend on people and ambitions beyond their reach, like PhDs and selfish lovers and pretty Irish middle school teachers. These are years Tony both granted his brother and denied him, and they are too short. To be the youngest child, his mother has told him, is a curse of sadness. Frankie imagines the day when the train will pull into Wilmington and no one will be waiting for him on the platform. It's always with him that day. And so already, as he takes the wheel of the enormous Sedan de Ville and drives out of the shadow of the Delaware Memorial Bridge and onto the highway, he wants to tell them, thank you for letting me go, and thank you for welcoming me home. And if you ask me right now to stay for good, I just might say yes and fall into your arms and never look back. Thanks. <laughs>